Um, hi, folks. My name is Matt Thomas, and thank you for tuning in to the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. This meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized with contributions from Stephen Slaughter and Jamie Kostelnik. For those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone or video camera. We're going to wait until the end of today's presentation to take questions. So in the meantime, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted and your video camera is off when you're not intending to speak. Jeff, thanks so much for introducing today's speaker. Hey, sure. Thanks, Matt. Uh, well, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dan Coe. Dan is the graphics editor at the Washington Geological Survey in Olympia, Washington. Prior to joining the Washington Geological Survey, Dan worked as a cartographer and GIS analyst with the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Dan has an associate's degree from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and a bachelor's degree in geography and Russian language from Portland State University. And Dan's made a career of merging geology and natural hazards in art. His specialty is visual communications or visual communication. In other words, he makes maps, illustrations, and data look cool. And this really results in people gaining a better understanding of geologic processes and hazards. Dan's probably best known for his work using LIDAR to track and illustrate historical meandering migration of rivers. And some of his work on the Mississippi River was recently pub published in National Geographic magazine. Lastly, on a personal note, as you could probably tell from his name and my name, I'm proud to be Dan's brother. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dan. Aw, shucks. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. <laughs> and um, thanks, Matt, for inviting me. I just wanted to add to that. Our, our mom is pretty happy that art school finally paid off too for me. So <laughs> I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> Yes, so I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you for joining in. And um, I'm going to be talking today about how our publications group here at the Washington Geological Survey supports our landslide hazard group with maps and graphics and how we tell some of the larger landslide related stories of our state along the way. Um, I'm going to also discuss my general mapping workflow and give one example of how I create LIDAR based landslide images. So I am part of the Washington Geological Survey's GIS and publications team. So our team publishes and promotes the work and data that our geoscientists produce. We also manage the survey's websites. We produce posters, maps, pamphlets, and other education and outreach materials for the public as well. Um, my role within the group is as graphics editor. Um, I work on you know, most things visual that we publish, including illustrations, photography, videos, um, but my main role is as the lead cartographer, map maker. Um, I also have a particular interest, as Jeff was saying, in visualizing um, geologic hazards in landforms, uh, particularly with LIDAR data. So just to give you a little bit of background on our um, landslide hazards program, the original, or excuse me, the origins of our landslide hazard team goes back to the 2014 SR530 landslide, also known as the OSO landslide. Um, as you may know, 43 lives were lost in this event and almost 50 houses were destroyed as well. Um, shortly after, well, actually, here's an aerial photo of the valley after the landslide to give you a nice overview of what that looked like. And here is a LIDAR derived image of that same area that shows the SR530 landslide kind of in the darker orange, surrounded by all the other landslide deposits in the valley. So this LIDAR image shows that, you know, it wasn't an isolated event, and it also demonstrates the utility of LIDAR in identifying these landslide prone areas. So with, with that in mind, in 2015, in the wake of this tragedy, the Washington State Legislature mandated that the Washington Geological Survey form a LIDAR program to collect high resolution elevation data. And they also allocated funds to form a landslide hazards program to study and map landslides in Washington state. So here is our current iteration of the, the landslide hazard team. We've got Kate Mickelson, Kara Fisher, Emily Richard, Mitch Allen, and Josh Hardesty. Um, full disclosure, Kate, I'm married to Kate, so I get all the insider landslide information <laughs> from her. And um, we also have two project-based um, geologists as well, and looking forward to, in the near future, hiring two additional geologists for our 
um, wildfire associated debris flow team. So our, our landslide team um, kind of focuses on three main tasks. They do a lot of other stuff as well, but these are the three main ones. Um, they fulfill several of these duties, systematically mapping landslides throughout the state, mostly on a county by county basis, creating landslide inventories. Um, they do post wildfire debris flow assessments, and they also respond to landslide emergencies, primarily to assess potential threats to public safety. So again, I'm going to discuss some ways that our publications team has supported these efforts with maps and graphics for publications and for education and outreach materials as they relate to landslide hazards. So the LHP um, aims many of their early efforts at Washington's most populated areas and counties. And one of the first counties that they mapped was King County, which is the home of Seattle. So here's a map of the areas that they covered. And you can see they covered over two thirds of the county in that assessment. So around that same time, um, Stephen Slaughter, the LHP manager at the time, asked me to make an image of some really interesting landslides in the Cedar River watershed um, just outside of Seattle. Um, the Cedar River watershed is where Seattle gets a lot of its water from. Um, so you can see in this image, it's just basically a forest covered area. You can't really see much. We'll switch over to the LIDAR view. And you can start to make out the outlines of these landslides now. Um, with a little added color, it really makes them pop out and by delineating them. So um, just another example of why LIDAR is very useful, particularly in Western Washington, where we have really dense tree cover in identifying landslides. <clears throat> One of the other early areas the LHP mapped was in the Columbia River Gorge in Southern Washington. Um, this particular photo is at the Piper Road landslide in Stevenson, Washington. So here's kind of an overview map of the that landslide inventory. They mapped over 2,000 landslides in the Columbia River Gorge vicinity, a lot of them highlighted in orange here. <clears throat> so one of the most interesting and well-known landslides in this area is actually the called the Bonneville landslide, which you may have heard of. Um, the Bonneville, was an, Bonneville landslide was an event that happened approximately 600 years ago in the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, basically, in the entire side of Table Mountain in the gorge collapsed and created a natural dam on the Columbia River, which is commonly referred to as the Bridge of the Gods. Um, eventually, this dam was breached and part of the landslide deposit was washed away, but most of the deposit still protrudes into the Columbia River near Cascade Locks. So this photo is actually of the modern day Bridge of the Gods that connects Washington to Oregon. And all that land you can see on the far side of the bridge is the toe of the Bonneville landslide. Here's another view. Um, you can see Table Mountain on the left and Greenleaf Peak on the right. And the faces of these mountains are actually scarps of the Cascade landslide complex. Uh, the deposit of the Bonneville landslide is actually that entire mass in the foreground of the photograph. So the size of the Bonneville landslide makes it really hard to comprehend from ground level. So we decided to make an interpretive map of this area that allowed us to view it virtually from above. So here's an aerial photo um, of the map area. You can see the Bonneville Dam on the lower left and the Bridge of the Gods on the right side crossing the river. So that's the bridge that was in that previous photo. Switching over to a landslide view, you can start to see the nature of the landslides in that area. There's some really hummocky lands, and you can kind of see the scarp up on the mountain peaks as well. And that landslide complex starts to become more apparent in this view. Now we'll add some color. This is the um, Bonneville landslide delineated itself, um, and you can see how it protrudes right into the Columbia River. The rest of the landslide complex flex was highlighted also, and that includes the Crescent Lake landslide and the Red Bluff landslide um, in front of Greenleaf Peak. Here's the full map. Um, and now you can see it also includes the approximate extent of the entire landslide that crossed the Columbia River. Um, and it also includes modern day features like the Pacific Crest Trail that crosses the Bridge of the Gods and traverses the landslide. So one thing I like to talk about when I'm talking about LiDAR-based maps is how they're really good at 
kind of connecting the larger geologic scale with the much smaller human scale. And this map, I feel like, is a really good example because you can see the bridge. You know, if you're on the ground, you can get an idea of how big that bridge is. And then you see this much larger landslide. Um, so you can have a, a pretty good idea of the size of what we're dealing with here. OK, I'm just going to kind of follow along our land with our landslide team and then compare some um, more featured landslides in these areas as we go along. So this is in northern Washington. This is Whatcom County. Um, our team also mapped in this area in western Whatcom County in 2019 and 2020. And much of this area is part of the Eocene Age sedimentary chuckanut formation, which is an area that's really, really susceptible to landslides, as you can see here. Oh, and this I wanted to mention really quickly. This um, image is from our geologic information portal, where we publish most of most of our data. Um, so this series of images was actually used in a story map we made several years back called the Bare Earth that demonstrates LiDAR's utility in mapping different kinds of geologic features, um, particularly in Western Washington where forest cover can obscure landforms. So this is actually um, above the Devil Slide, also known as the Van Zant Landslide in Whatcom County. We'll switch from a photograph to a 10 meter DEM. So this is kind of the older topography that we had access to pre-LIDAR. And you can see there's some, some kind of lumpy landforms there that could or may or may not be landslides. But when you switch over to a landslide view, things really come into focus. It's kind of like putting on a pair of glasses and you can really see um, that lion's landslide in the image. So we can also delineate it and add some elevation-based color and um, you know add that river in there to give it scale to make it really pop out. Not far from the Devil Slide is actually another really, really large landslide along the North Fork of the Nooksack River. Here's the photo view, kind of an oblique view. We'll switch over to the LiDAR hillshade and then highlight the slide itself. And one interesting thing you can see here um, in this image is the, the lines kind of highlighting the bedding of the Chuckanut Formation. And you can see that landslide failed right along that. Um, that bedding plane right there. Um, one also an interesting thing I want to point out is the Racehorse Creek landslide that's at the top of the image. We're going to zoom into that here in just a second. And that landslide actually happened in 2009. Um, this larger one in the foreground dwarfs it in size, but the Racehorse Creek landslide itself was quite large. So we'll switch over to that. So here's a, a UAV image that we took in 2017 of the Racehorse Creek landslide. You can see it also. Um, slid right along that bedding plane as well. We took these photos, yeah, in 2017. Here's another view looking at the scarp, and you can really see those bedding lines really clearly there. Um, the reason I'm bringing up this landslide is because um, the Chuckanut Formation, as well as the Racehorse Creek landslide, are just chocked full of really, really interesting fossils, um, particularly for Washington. So it's really well known, that formation, for its plant fossils. There's big um, Eocene age palm leaves that you can find that are the size of you know, a garage door. Maybe not quite that big, but pretty, pretty large. But in the Racehorse Creek landslide, it actually exposed a lot of um, animal footprints, which is a pretty rare thing for, for Washington fossils. You can see some examples of those here. And on a related note, around that same time, we also made an interpretive map highlighting the fossils and the structure of the Chuckanut Formation. Um, this part of this map is actually just south of the Bellingham area near Larrabee State Park, if you've been, been in that area before. All right, so moving on, we also make interpretive graphics to help explain past geologic events. So this is a photo of Lena Lake, which is a really popular hiking and camping destination in the Olympic Mountains. Um, this lake was actually created over a thousand years ago when a landslide dammed this valley. So usually late in the summer, the water in the lake gets lower and you can start to see the, the stumps of this ghost forest that was drowned over a thousand years ago poking out of the water. And you can also see that landslide deposit, all those really rocky, that rocky shoreline at the far end um, that blocked the valley. Here's another photo by Pat Pringle. Um, Pat and others were able to date this landslide event at, to about 1,300 years ago um, by coring these trees and using dendrochronology. So um, he's done that in several lakes in this area as well. So 
I really wanted to create a series of kind of maps or images that that show this event over time, um, bringing it from kind of when it happened 1300 years ago up to present day, since this is a pretty popular area where people hike and spend a lot of time. So by combining and editing imagery, um, the digital surface model that includes the trees um, and the digital terrain model where you can see the landslide deposit and scarp itself, um, I combined all those in Photoshop and made a series of images that show the landslide event itself, as well as the modern day um, conditions and infrastructure. So this view is what the lake may have looked like about 1300 years ago uh, before the landslide occurred. So moving ahead, the landslide comes down, blocks Lena Creek as it's flowing downhill. That newly created um, Lena Lake drowns the nearby forest in the valley. And then we're gonna just fast forward to present day. And you can see highlighted in green is the Lena Lake Trail that now goes up the valley to the lake and onwards to the Brothers and Upper Lena Lake. But the interesting thing about the Lena Lake Trail is it actually crosses the very lower part of the toe of that landslide. And when you're on the trail, it's super fascinating because you're just hiking along in a pretty standard Pacific Northwest forest. And then all of a sudden you're wandering through almost house-sized boulders um, intermingled in the trees. And it's it's kind of a rather shocking <laughs> thing to walk through. And those boulders are the toe of this, um, you know, over a thousand year old landslide along the trail. So th these images we actually included, we made a project a few years back called the Washington 100 that highlights um, 100 places to experience interesting geology on publicly accessible lands in Washington. So this was one of the places that we highlighted. We also create other kinds of custom graphics for our landslide team, such as these showing shallow and deep landslides. Um, often these graphics, you know, we're not necessarily making them from scratch. We may be modeling them on previous um, pre-existing illustrations that we want to make more place appropriate for conditions in the Pacific Northwest. So you can see that little evergreen tree at the top of the hill there, or you know the water at the bottom kind of representing Puget Sound in these graphics. Um, other times we need to make an entirely new image that is, um, you know, we, we can't find the particular graphic that we want to show a particular process or feature. So we want to make it from scratch. So often these will start off as sketched ideas. Either a geologist will sketch them out and give it to our team to create, or we'll sketch them out ourselves after talking with the team. Um, so this is a graphic that we made several years back um, that turned into this. Um, that This is for showing signs of landslide activity. And this particular graphic was included in our homeowner's guide to landslides um, for Washington and Oregon. This was actually a collaborative project between us and Dogami in Oregon. Another fun thing we did with this graphic, we actually adapted it for our geologic risk booklet and made it into a timeline of significant um, Washington landslides, um, starting back with the Bonneville landslide moving all the way up to the Oso landslide at the bottom. All right, switching gears a little bit here to alluvial fans. Um, our LHP team also maps alluvial fans, such as this large one in Douglas County along the Columbia River. Thank you to Jeff for taking this nice photo um, that we get to use. Many alluvial fans are, are attractive places to build homes in Washington because they are raised above nearby river floodplains and often provide really panoramic views of the surrounding landscape. Um, unfortunately, this can put people and property at risk since many of these areas are prone to, or excuse me, many alluvial fans are more prone to debris flows after large storm events. So this is actually a LIDAR image of that same, that same landslide from the previous photo. And moving on to the Methow Valley up in Northern Washington. Um, this is just an aerial view of the Methow Valley. This region has had a number of large wildfires in the past decade, making it more susceptible to wildfire associated debris flows. Um, there are also many structures built on alluvial fans in this valley due to ex extremely scenic setting. Switching over to a LIDAR view, kind of strip digitally stripping away those trees, you can really see the fans as they emerge into the into the valley of the Metau River. Just highlighting them here and switching back to the photo, keeping those, those um, outlines of the fans. You can see a lot of these are heavily forested as well. 
Nearby is the Twisp River Valley, and the Twisp also has many of the same conditions of the Metau Valley with a lot of alluvial fans. And in this particular map, um, it was used to show a lot of the structures that are built on several of these alluvial fans, putting them at risk. Moving south just a little bit, um, here's a nice photo by Stephen Slaughter. This is actually an engineered drainage channel on a large alluvial fan at Slide Ridge along Lake Chelan on the east side of the Cascade Mountains. This area has had many debris flows that have overtopped the road at this particular location. Um, and recently a new bridge and large culvert were just built um, to accommodate a lot of these debris flows so they don't impact the road above. They made a really large culvert that allows the flow to go under the bridge and there's easy access to it so it can be excavated out once they fill up that culvert area. So we're gonna look at this area, but kind of from the sky. So zooming back out, here's an oblique view of the area um, using imagery draped over a digital surface model. And you can actually see that drainage channel, that engineered channel in a straight line on the left-hand alluvial fan kind of coming down and crossing the road and going down into the lake. We'll add a little bit of the digital terrain model in here to highlight the fans themselves. And then just switch it over to the full bare earth view so you can really see the nature of the landscape above and on these fans. So then another nice example of connecting that human scale to the geologic scale is we added the all these little white points or structures that are built on the fans and pointed out that engineered drainage channel as well. But you can see all these little rivulets, these channels coming down the, the fans and why this might be a dangerous place potentially to have a house. Here's one other view of it. Okay, and recently our landslide team actually just completed mapping um, alluvial fans in Klickitat County, which is in the Columbia River Gorge. Here's an aerial view of some, some alluvial fans. They're pretty hard to see in this photo. When you switch over to LIDAR, by one, one trick I like to use, especially with kind of low profile landforms and features, is if you just lower your lighting angle of your hill shade down um, when you create it, you can make these landforms pop out. It gives them a little more shadowing and throws a little more shadows in those channels. So by lowering that angle, you're able to make these landforms a little more visible. And of course, you can add color to really make them pop out so the untrained eye can see where they are. Uh, moving out to wildfire associated debris flows. So this photo was actually just taken last week in the Okanagan region of Washington. And you can see our geologist, Emily Richard, kind of standing in the middle there with the, the safety orange vest on for scale. Um, our wildfire associated landslide emergency response team, also known as WALERT, which is a little easier to say, um, they assist communities impacted by wildfires by conducting rapid debris flow hazard assessments in the areas recently burned by wildfires. Um, again, this photo was taken in Okanagan County, or maybe not Okanagan County, in the Okanagan recently. This, uh, this debris flow actually happened about two weeks ago. So this is a super recent event um, and it happened in a heavily burned area. And I just wanted to give a give a little plug. Emily actually gave a really fantastic presentation about um, wildfire associated debris flows to our division yesterday. Um, one of the best presentations I've heard in a really long time. Um, and I also heard that she's going to be giving a version of it at the AEG conference in Portland later this year. So if you are going to be at AEG, I encourage you to attend her talk because it was really, really fantastic. Okay, so um, we made these block diagram images um, for our Wallert webpage. Um, kind of just to describe the general conditions that can lead to a post wildfire debris flow. So these were kind of meant for the general public. So here's a nice idyllic setting in the mountains. We've got houses at the bottom of the valley. We have a big wildfire sweep through burning trees upslope from these houses. And then we have a large storm event which can trigger these debris flows. So just a simple graphic to kind of relate the conditions that can lead to these sorts of events. <clears throat> we also support our Wallert team by making maps for their emergency assessment reports, um, such as this burned area, um, or excuse me, soil burn severity map for the Evans Canyon fire a few years back. 
um, and this fire burn perimeter and alluvial fan map for the Cedar Creek and Cub Creek fires from a couple of years ago. Our publication team also recently made this fantastic fact sheet for our Waller team. Um, and this is a really useful resource and tool to have out in the fields when they're out there assessing areas, um, often to give to homeowners to help explain the risk that the hazards may pose to their, their property in the, um, the area in which they live. So this is a really, really nice thing that they can just take out and it, it kind of um, is a nice starting point for having a conversation about debris flows and wildfires. Okay, switching gears a little, I wanted to show a few of our volcano graphics um, as they relate to lahar hazards, both in the past um, and potential hazards in the future. Um, this is an image showing glaciers of Mount Baker, um, also known as Kulshan, which is a stratovolcano in Northwestern Washington. So heavily glaciated volcanoes like Mount Baker and Mount Rainier shown here, um, of course, pose a potential lahar risk to downstream communities. Um, we've got, what we've got in this image are the USGS lahar hazard zones for Mount Rainier draped over the nearby landscape. And you can see the community of Ording kind of in the lower center of the picture is built um, right in the path of that lahar zone. And Ording's actually built on top of about a 30 foot thick lahar deposit from the electron mud flow. Um, that buried this area about 600 years ago. So we'll just zoom into Ording. And you can see not only is it in a Lahar hazard zone, it's also sandwiched right in between two major rivers, the Carbon River and the Puyallup River. So, um, you know, people that live in this area, a lot of them are very aware of the volcano hazard. You see volcano evacuation signs on a lot of the roads in these areas. But one thing I like to point out with this, again, with LIDAR is, you know, by using that digital surface model and showing the structures and the trees, you can actually see the little housing developments that are built right smack in the middle um, of this valley and this hazard zone. Um, so again, LIDAR is nice for connecting that human scale to the geologic scale. Okay, and now for kind of the most infamous of Washington's dangerous volcanoes, Mount St. Helens. Um, tomorrow is actually the 43rd anniversary of Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption, um, which of course killed 57 people and caused widespread damage to the surrounding landscapes and communities. One of the largest debris avalanches in recorded history accompanied that eruption, um, which it also buried the upper reaches of the North Fork Toodle River and eventually fed a lahar that traveled down the Toodle and Cowlitz River drainages. Um, we recently published this map of Mount St. Helens that features the ways the landscape of the mountain has changed since the eruption, uh, including how the North Fork Toodle River has been transformed over time by all of the sediment that was deposited in it. Um, you may have heard, interestingly, a large debris flow actually just took out a bridge on the road to Johnston Ridge um, Visitor Center two days ago, right before it was scheduled to open. And the visitor center is now probably going to be closed for the rest of the summer. And if you haven't seen any images of it, I encourage you to go online and check them out. There's a really kind of really great video um, overview of the debris flow itself. Um, that's pretty interesting. But bad timing for the summer tourist season on Mount St. Helens. So here's a photo um, getting back to the Toodle River. This is looking up the North Fork Toodle River Valley towards the mountain. And you can see it's choked with mud and debris um, after that debris avalanche in Lahar. Fast forward to near present day. This is a more recent aerial photo of that same area, kind of looking straight down at it. And you can see there's just tons and tons of sediment here, but we'll switch over to a LIDAR view. And <clears throat> it's pretty interesting because you can see the big chunks of mountain that are you know still very apparent on the north side of this floodplain here in the North Fork Toodle River. And you know the sediment that is in this river is continuing to be transported downstream and it's still causing engineering challenges for those attempting to manage all that sediment. Um, there could be many, many talks just about that, that subject all alone. Okay, so that's enough of that sort of show and tell of some of our graphics, but I also wanted to briefly talk about how many of these LIDAR-based images are made. Um, my general workflow with, with maps and graphics is to start, these types of maps and graphics at least, is to start in a GIS um, and 
move and finish in a graphics program such as Photoshop or Illustrator. So um, for most of the perspective view images that I make, I actually use a, an application called Quick Terrain Modeler, which is a LIDAR analysis and visualization software. Um, and the reason I use it is because it renders 3D views of LIDAR super sharply, way, way clearer than um, ArcGIS Pro does, for example. Um, I generally get all my data organized and clipped in, in Esri products before creating the layout um, in QD, QT Modeler. I then export a series of images over to Photoshop where I combine and blend them together. Generally, if there are labels or other vector data that needs to be added, I'll then bring the final image over to Illustrator and add those details at that point before finishing the map. So I'm going to use this image from the title slide as kind of an example to show you all some, some bits of the process in making the image. So I have a video. Cross your fingers. Hopefully it will work. And this is just to show you a couple things in Quick Terrain Modeler. Please work. All right, it's working. So we're kind of looking straight down at that landslide right now. In a second, we're going to pan to an oblique view. And you can do a lot of the things you can do in other GIS programs in Quick Terrain Modeler. You know, you can turn on the um, kind of color-based digital elevation model, which you'll see here in a second. So you can see the color fading from high to low elevations. You can add in um, aerial photography, drape it over the model. You can add in vector um, fill. So this is just the landslide highlighted. But the really handy thing you can do is just dynamically change your sun angle by holding down control and moving your mouse around. Um, and this can be really handy when you're trying to visualize a landslide in this program. So um, if any of you have access to this program, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's, it's very, very powerful in um, visualizing landforms, particularly landslides. So generally, um, once I get my layout set up in Quick Terrain Modeler, I'll, I will export several layers to Photoshop. So here are some examples of some layers that I might use for an image like this. There's a couple of digital elevation models showing high to low elevations based with color, um, a couple different angled hill shades or shaded relief, and I'll generally have a polygon of the landslide fill itself. That way I can use it to mask out the landslide. And often I'll use a photo for various purposes um, as well. So these are some of the images that I might export. And I'm just going to show you some Photoshop um, techniques that I use to make this image now. So here is, just to start off with, one of those standard gray hill shades. Um, I'm going to layer the next hill shade over top, give it a little bit of transparency. Um, and that just helps bring out more of the details in the landslide. There's all sorts of things you can do with shaded relief to emphasize landslide features, of course, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, I wasn't particularly happy with the way the digital elevation model colors worked with this image. So I just made a fill. Um, you've seen in the past images, I often use orange or or orangey tones to highlight landslides. Um, I like using orange because, you know, it's, it's a hazard color, number one. It really can draw your attention to a feature. And it's also not red. Red has a lot of somewhat negative connotations um, and can be problematic to use for various reasons. So I like using orange. Um, it's a little bit safer of a color to use. But so I just filled this and I use what's called a layer mode. And if you don't know what layer modes, I and you you make graphics or maps of of um, landforms, I highly suggest you check it out. I used uh, what's called a hard light layer mode. And layer modes actually just affect the way layers interact with each other. So instead of adding a transparency, which can kind of dull down the image or fade it out, layer modes can help keep the crispness while also um, you know, keeping the full saturation of the color that you're wanting to use. So I actually toned down the opacity to about 60% and used that hard light layer mode. Um, next, I used a layer mask, which you can see circled on the um, right hand side, just to kind of fade that orange so it just shows up in the bottom part of the image. I added another layer of that orange layer, and instead of using a hard light mode, I used a difference mode. And the ef general effect of that is it changed the color to a purple color. Um, I toned down the opacity to just 25%, and then I added that layer mask to fade it to the upper corner. And I just turned both of those on, and you kind of have a quasi 
DEM effects where you have the higher elevation being one color and the lower elevation being another color. So I like this a little bit better than the, the standard DEM that I had exported. Um, next, I made a lot of color and lightness adjustments. The main one being adding some drop shadow around the landslide itself. So I'll go back and forth here to, excuse me, to show you that. So here's before and here's after. So it makes the landslide pop out a little more. And the next step, I added a fill layer to just the landslide itself. I think it was filled with an orange color. And I used a saturation color mode and just turned it way down to about 15% opacity. So it's a very subtle difference, but it makes that landslide a little more saturated than the background and it makes it stand out just a little bit more. And the next step is to add a mask to everything that wasn't the landslide. So in this case, I made a white fill and then turned it down to about 25% opacity. Um, I decided to make the background darker than the landslide instead of lighter. This actually looks pretty good, but I thought it looked better dark. So I used the subtract layer mode, which made everything darker in the background. So now the landslide is the lightest part of the image and it brings it to the forefront, giving it a good, we call figure ground relationship. And then the final step was just to add a white outline to the landslide to make it pop just a little bit more. So here's Here's the final image, going back to what we started with, with that standard gray hill shade to the final image. So just a nice effect um, using color and contrast to really focus the viewer on the item that you want them to look at. So um, you could go in and add labels and other things afterwards, bring it into Illustrator and do, it, do that. But I just thought I would end right here. And I think, Yes, that is all I have for you. Um, thank you very much for listening. If you're still here, I welcome um, any questions that you may have. I do have some related links that I'll try to drop into the chat um, for those that want to see more about Washington landslide related content.